this is how we keep the different parts of the chain humanized to one another by having this get together every two weeks. And especially if you're not in the office, especially if you're not, not even the same continent in most cases, <laughs> yeah. um, kind of need this, this human touch that, you know, forces everyone to connect. All right, let's dive straight into it. So to start us off, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into being the CRO of Plan Day. Mm -hmm. um, what's your journey been like? What, how, how did it all happen? Yeah, so um, I actually pretty early on during my master's um, started working for a company called Falcon, Falcon IO, uh, mm -hmm. previously known as Falcon Social. Um, and there I started when we were like 10 people, like super mm -hmm. early on. Um, before that, I worked in a venture capital firm. So at Falcon, I pretty early on started working on basically raising funds with the CEO. Yeah? So that was kind of, you know, part of this. And, and if you want to do that in a team of 10 people, you need to do the whole backend work as well, kind of finance, HR operations and so forth. Yeah. Um, and then we kind of grew very quickly to, I don't know, 200, 300, 400 people. Mm -hmm. um, and during that journey, um, I stopped being kind of on the back end side, which is kind of then, you know, CFO, gray hair, old experienced guy coming in. And actually, then I jumped on the revenue side, right? We just started out as a, I guess now you would call a revenue operations manager. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, director and then, you know, VP and kind of the organization below me grew. Um, and um, through some kind of um, ways, I suddenly then uh, ended up owning the SDR team which kind of at first was like 10 people. And then it's now, I think, 100 plus people. Wow. Um, uh, grew the performance marketing team, kind of did all of that stuff. And then uh, at some point, as, as then kind of becoming C-level, uh, owned everything from uh, marketing, sales, CS. And then, so back then we, you know, I feel we were pretty early on on the revenue operations kind of wave. We we were like, should we call it revenue operations or should we call it commercial operations? I mean, I ended up calling it commercial operations. So, so now mm -hmm. it's obviously clear it's revenue operations, but back then it was kind of in between. Mm -hmm. So marketing, sales, CS, and a commercial operations layer, right? Um, mm -hmm. So basically the COO title, we exited Falcon. I stayed a year for the integration and then I started looking around, jumped to Plan Day. Um, and in Plan Day, I took on the R instead of the O, but it was basically the same, the same role uh, uh, basically looking after, again, marketing, sales, CS, and then have a revenue operations layer, uh, basically below that, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, now been a year with Plan Day. Uh, we exited again, you know, to zero <laughs> this time. Um, so pretty busy time. That's, that's also why I'm now taking some time out uh, and chillaxing a little bit with the family. Um, but that, that's kind of is the story. So my, my CRO role is not the hey, I was a, a rockstar AE and then became the VP <laughs> of sales. And then I wanted yep. to have a C-level and, you know, this CSO sounds shit. So that's why, you know, <laughs> you go to the CRO. And yep. I'm really, really much kind of the guy that came from the um, revenue operations side, actually, um, running these different teams. That's pretty cool, actually. And I guess one of my questions to you is, how would you define revenue operations? Because everyone has such a different answer for that. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people look at uh, revenue operations, think it's it's the, the the cooler word for sales operations, which it just isn't. Um, revenue operations for me really goes um, across my whole stack of teams, right? Um, so in my op revenue and operations team, I think really kind of we're splitting it into three distinct areas right now. Kind of one is um, one is really the operations team, kind of. This is, you know, we have a director of revenue operations and below that we have marketing operations manager, sales operation manager, CS operation manager. And these guys and, and girls are really, you know, they are really connecting uh, the nice, nice world of, you know, the Salesforce admin that is very clean and straightforward. And there's just one way of doing things with the ugly world of, uh, of sales reps, basically, or with, you know, people and with teams and issues, right? Kind of they're, they're that glue that, that have a lack in reality or in the in the messy world and one lag in, in the systems world, right? Um, 
and they do all the, you know, for example, the sales ops guy does like commissions and does like, you know, flows and does like all of these things, right? So the, the typical sales ops role. Mm -hmm. And then the other lag is systems. So we have basically a team uh, looking only after systems. So this usually is your Salesforce admin, but you know, uh, when you have HubSpot, then you need someone to run this as well. If you have kind of gain side, someone needs to run that as well. Um, so basically a systems team together, right? Um, and then the last lag, which we were by, uh, building now on plan day and uh, had that for a while actually on, uh, on, on Falcon side is basically a BI and data team, right? Mm -hmm. um, so really the, and it, it, it really kind of also shows the nice evolution of, of the revenue operations because you, you usually start out with someone that says like, hey, I need a sales report now, right? Let's mm -hmm. hire some junior guy to come in and you know, work with Salesforce. And then you specialize, you split those two things and have like someone only looking after Salesforce or Salesforce admin and then someone really looking after kind of how, how to read that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And once you're, once you're done and have really nice setup for the systems, uh, then you suddenly start asking bigger questions of how does that number in this system work with that number in that system? Mm -hmm. And that's where you then move into BI, right? Where, where you kind of go one step above the um, tooling reporting capabilities um, and then basically need a, you know, a data lake and like a looker or a power BI and kind of a team of guys kind of working on that. Um, that's kind of how we're thinking about revenue operations. And, and the short answer is probably it's, um, we see it as the glue across my, my go-to-market teams, right? It's really the glue connecting all the different pieces. It's usually also my, um, so I, I guess in like other, uh, non SaaS, more traditional organizations, you would call it your your um, your executive team or something like that, right? It's kind of the the team that that I dump a lot of projects on, and then they're gonna kind of go to work and do that stuff, right? Yeah. Um, I don't go to the VP of sales and say like, hey, fix you know fix that process issue or something, right? It's yeah. kind of it's really it's really these guys, right? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's a great answer. I Actually, the glue. I, I have once had someone say to me that revenue operations is kind of like a pilot's dashboard and it either flashes green or red and without it, a pilot can't fly. So that's yeah. actually a cool way that you described it as the glue, which I totally agree with, especially in the last three to five years, how much revenue operations has changed. Yeah. It's cool that um, that you guys see it that way. So, you know, diving into, you know, revenue relationships and how revenue teams operate with each other so we found that you know sales and revenue operations are a very human sport at the top level so what are some of the fundamental ways of driving communication between your revenue teams so i think one of the advantages that i have is that um you know vp marketing vp cs vp sales vp revenue operation all of these all of these report directly to me so this is my team right so yeah. i can create a in-group feeling rather than a, hey, it's me versus the CMO, right? Um, which is which is super helpful, right? Um, and and I think, you know, what, what in the past we actually have less struggled with uh, aligning my team and, and making them work together and, you know, having them kind of bridge the, hey, I need to hit my target and now I want to, you know, apply pressure to everyone else to help me, which is kind of usually how this works out. Mm -hmm. And really more understanding both sides of the coin uh, between my VP sales and my VP marketing. Um, and, um, and actually kind of that, that kind of works out. I think where it uh, more and more kind of falls flat is then actually then the layer below again, right? It's like where you then have, you know, uh, in my case, kind of a directorship team, which is then uh, uh, still seeing the siloed world. And, and really this is where you rely a lot on, um, uh, on on the leaders below you to kind of make sure that kind of that is communicated. Yeah. Yeah. One one other trick that was well, actually not a trick. One other thing that we're doing actually is um, so as a company we have company wide kind of town halls, um, monthly, quarterly, whatever cadence. Um, and uh, what I do on top with with my team is basically a uh, every a fortnightly. So mm -hmm. a fortnightly uh, one hour session. We call it revenue all hands. Uh, it's kind of a broadcast of, uh, you know, I do some boring stuff in the beginning just to kind of check some boxes like, hey, you know, this is what's going on in the top level. This is what's going on now that we are priced by zero there. Um, it's kind of a hygiene thing. People aren't excited to hear it, but they need to hear it. Um, yeah. If it's not there, they will be like, you know, I don't know what's going on. Um, yeah. 
And then actually I stopped talking and we have people from within the revenue organization share stories, right? And kind of marketing talks about what they did in order to increase whatever, right? Um, or, you know, CS does, hey, we had a finding here. I think everyone should kind of know about it. And this is how we uh, try and kind of keep the different parts of the chain uh, humanized to one another, right? Kind of once you get into the area of like, yeah, those are just the sales guys, right? Right then, then kind of the trust thing breaks down, um, and then you have uh, issues with the handover to CS, with marketing to sales, and so forth. Um, and by by having this get together, you know, on you know every two weeks, and especially if you're not in the office, especially if you're not not even the same continent in most cases, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, you kind of need this this human touch that you know forces everyone to connect, right? Um, if if that answers your question. Yeah, definitely does. And uh, I, you know, picking up on that human touch, it's definitely something that I find a lot of leaders and, you know, in the C-suite and board level, a lot of people forget about the human touch and focus purely on results. So I was just wondering, how do you, how did you come up with this culture of having, you know, the culture of the human touch? Was that your doing or was that the company's doing or how did that come? Mm, yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure if I would call it the human touch. I think that that goes... <laughs> That, that you know those are your words you know yeah. <laughs> um, I think I think for me it's um, uh, I think you just you just have to trust one another right uh, so if you really think it is a division of labor game right kind of you know that person does that and that person does that and so forth and once there's pressure on the system you know the different pieces will be like well you're doing this wrong you're doing that wrong uh, I you know I mean, this is probably a joke that kind of many people kind of heard, but it's like, you know, sales guys always think they can do a better job at marketing, right? Kind of yeah. it's like, yeah, you know, they just, you know, why do they doing this? And, you know, this podcast didn't help me close any business, right? So, I mean, yeah. um, and, um, and, and once you have the pressure going, it's just really important that the different pieces of the chain are like, wait a minute, you know, I know you have trouble right now, um, but I, I trust you do a good job. I'll leave you to it. Uh, and I'll do the best with what, you know, with what comes from you, uh, basically this, this marketing sales kind of conundrum and try and kind of hit my targets, right? While marketing then at the same time also, you know, what, what, what often happens on the marketing side is like, well, I hit my MQL target, right? Uh, so, you know, it's not my problem. You know, you just didn't pick up. The, I mean, um, and, um, and this kind of where you go a little bit into the alignment of metrics and so forth, right? But, um, but, you know, if, if you have if you have that kind of uh, way of communicating and then pushing away guilt or pushing away issues or uh, creating pressure, uh, the the one thing you know next to metric, which is kind of your human touch that really helps bridge this, is is somewhat of a trust and or respect in the other team's role and capabilities of trying to achieve their targets, mm -hmm. um, instead of like complete mayhem and breaking down and. Uh, and, and frustration that then otherwise comes from that. That's a great answer. Going on that trust factor, how would you say people in the revenue function develop trust? Yeah, I think <laughs> um, uh, developing trust in is a I mean it's a human thing. It's not a it's not a it's not a business or revenue no. thing. I think it has a lot to do with uh, working together is one thing. Kind of achieving difficult things is another having a drink once in a while right i mean yeah. this is this is part of this right socializing um and um and then kind of that's how you how you develop trust right and another way is also to open up about um you know the the difficulties that are there right kind of saying like yes you know we didn't deliver those leads uh, and yes uh, we tried a lot we spent a lot of money we did these things something is wrong. I don't know what it is. We'll figure this out. But until I figure this out, I need you to, you know, try the best you can to hit your target. Besides that, you know, what else can we do? Kind of really having this as a, how do we do this together mentality instead of a, um, well, he didn't do his job, so I can't do mine. And therefore my target should be lower kind of uh, conversation. Right. Um, and, and I think this, you know, first I talked a little bit about the mechanics of trust, and then I talked about kind of you know how, how you can do that, which is this vulnerability kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but really, making other people understand your issues is extremely helpful 
uh, because then it doesn't become a, um, you know, it's, it's not the person that's being criticized of the situation. And suddenly it's less of a personal thing and it's more of a, how do we deal with that problem kind of thing, right? And, and I think that just helps relationships across. Yeah, definitely. I, yeah, I think trust is, I think trust in teams, it takes a strong team to develop trust and have that continuous thing, which is something that, you know, speaking to quite a lot of people in revenue and sales, a lot of people are like, yeah, we, we've got trust, but not fully. So I think it definitely takes a strong team. No, and, and that's, that's right. The thing is, so the, the reason why I'm kind of so um, kind of going around this topic is um, once you start pushing pressure on the machinery, right, um, and you don't have some of those, those basics in place, uh, amongst other, I mean, there are many, many different basics, but amongst some, it's trust, um, you know, the, the pressure will just evade, right, because you have uh, you have so many different ways within your go-to-market teams to blame someone else, and if if you don't stop that, uh, then 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 the pressure will just not go anywhere, right? So this is that's kind of how I'm thinking about it. Yeah, definitely, I completely agree with you. I think that level of trust, if if you don't have it, the pressure does, you know, kill people's initiatives and motivations and stuff like that but going back to what you said about you know we touched on metrics just a second ago so what metrics do you really focus on at your core as a revenue function what do you focus on yeah um so plan a is so we're doing we, have, we really have two funnels one is you know the standard book a demo or um or the sdr books a demo funnel yeah. right and then the other one is actually more product led, which merges a little bit into a book demo funnel as well. So, so basically we have a trial sign up and we have a book demo sign up and then we have SDRs and partners kind of doing the, the other stuff. Um, for the most part, um, it's actually, um, you know, some version of an opportunity, right? And it, it usually is uh, someone showing up, someone that is, doesn't need to be the decision maker, but a champion or someone with the problem or knowledge of the problem mm -hmm. showing up um, for 30 plus minutes um, and um, and basically in an organization that can afford, you know, doesn't have a budget or a line item. Can, I mean, I'm going a little bit through this band thing. and I, I know it's not that super popular anymore, but really about, hey, you know, a person that is close to the problem and a problem present and an organization that can afford the, whatever ticket you're selling, right? Yeah. Um, and um, and really on the, the straightforward, let's say sales led funnel, it's a, you know, a meeting held on accepted opportunity or uh, a sales qualified opportunity or however you want to spin it. It's not just opening the opportunity. There's usually one other qualifier afterwards, but that's usually actually the connector, right? And and this is something where um, where marketing can work towards uh, very clearly, very easily. Uh, also have the MDR team uh, be part of the marketing budget, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically the the opportunity uh, stage then forward is then on the AEs, right? And and that's kind of where where both parties kind of come together, uh, at least in the marketing and sales world. I think the next step to CS is sometimes a bit more uh, diffuse actually, and there's less friction between sales and, and CS. And if there's friction, usually it's more about product actually and discipline of selling. Um, yeah. So this is actually where, where I, my relationship to the CTO is, is something that even more comes in so than within, within my team, right? Um, and I guess then the other metric uh, steering for is uh, customer acquisition cost payback, um, yeah. right? So CAC payback. Um, usually that's the thing that's being discussed uh, on, on the C-level, on the board level. Um, that's, that's how we make investment decisions. It's like, hey, is this SDR team working out? How much longer do we want to give that? You know, is this marketing tactic working out? Kind of how, how does that work, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think though, just as, you know, an opportunity created cannot be the same quality uh, as some others. Um, there's also a, um, you know, you can't. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm still here. Sorry, Maybe. kind of, I think my, my teams in the background are just kind of, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, 
you know, CAC payback can also sometimes be misleading, um, you know, especially for, uh, for marketing channels where you just don't have a nice attribution. Uh, for example, this blog, right? Or this yeah. podcast, how are you going to attribute revenue back to that, right? It's going to probably going to be very difficult. And then, you know, where does your salary go, right? And it, and these kind of things, it's like, um, while CAC payback is super important to keep in mind, it's also really important to understand the the gaps uh, and the uh, the mistakes that come out of it. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and, you know, if you do, you can actually use it in a very granular way, right? You can go down to... Uh, I even did it based on AE, right? Kind of what is the fully loaded tech payback of that AE, including everything that, you know, uh, you know was uh, spent and all leading up to that person and then, you know, coming out of it. And um, so it's it's a really powerful tool, but you just need to understand also the limitations of that, right? It's so really, again, opportunity creation um, and tech payback on the more uh, tactical strategic level. Yeah, it makes complete sense. Um, I guess with what you just said there, you know, how, how would you measure success for the metrics, for those metrics, other than what you mentioned? Is there any other way that you measure success? Um, besides the, besides those metrics or? Yes. How do you... Yeah. Besides those metrics, is there any other way that you measure I mean, success? Um, obviously kind of these things are kind of leading indicators really, right? Mm -hmm. It's about hitting the target. Um, what, what is just super important for me is, um, so we run in quarterly cycles and maybe it should really be monthly, but it's quarterly right now. Mm -hmm. um, and in order to kind of keep an organization running every day, you need something else. And just, this is a quarterly milestone, mm -hmm. which is why an you know, opportunity production uh, or creation is such a great thing to focus on because you base, I basically, we basically have a daily target, right? And every quarter when I do the kickoff, it's like, Hey, the new opportunity target is X for every day. And when we, when we then kind of hit it uh, on a daily basis, we celebrate that and, you know, it, it kind of works out, you know, sometimes we had two or three shots in the evening and then, you know, <laughs> some people pull through and get it done, right? And, and that's kind of actually, um, that's, you know, you know, defining success is usually, um, so in, in very crude terms has nothing to do with whatever metric you choose uh, or what the target is. Mm -hmm. It's whatever you define success as, right? Um, so for example, you know, when we have had challenging times through COVID, I didn't hand my board target through to my sales VP. I was not like, hey, you know, I have to hit that number, you have to hit that number. Um, I, I chose a different one. Um, and um, and um, what is super important for the organization is that some, so I sometimes say some graph needs to turn green. People don't, people rarely understand, you know, the two, three or four million that you're closed and what is good and what is bad. It's, it's when this graph turns green, people are like, okay, you know what? We're gonna keep the lights on. You know, we hit yeah. that target, great. Everyone will be happy. Um, and success, the success measure obviously, you know, in the end comes down to, are you hitting the plan that gets you funded or that gets you sold or kind of the, the, real, the real things. Yeah. But in an organization to lead it, um, it can be anything. Uh, it can be opportunities. It can be a, you know, you set the targets yourself. It, it, in the end, something needs to hit something else. And that's, that's what success actually looks like, right? And, and especially in sales organizations, um, this is then kind of creating a, a virtuous cycle, right? Kind of, hey, we can do this. Mm -hmm. Then you can talk about larger targets. You can talk about increasing quota, right? Because we hit last time and, you know, now we can kind of, you know, take it up a notch. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's, so success is a feeling uh, more so than it is a number, you know. I'm getting very kind of touchy feely like trust and human touch, and, you know. It's like, I love it. Do you know uh, what? Okay. I love it because when it comes to a lot of leaders that I personally speak to and that my team speaks to, a lot of people are very focused on pure numbers and pure data. But the way that you can actually turn that, like those numbers and that data into that human touch and actually speak about it, like, you know, we're, we're leaving the light on because of these factors. So that human touch and data really do work well together, which is mm -hmm. great that you've picked up on that, actually. Um, I think a lot more people need to view it that way. Um, and I think they'd be a lot 
more successful. So I guess to round us off, um, I'm going to ask you a question about mistakes. So what mistakes have you learned from that you could share with the community right now? Yeah, um, focusing too much on CAC payback. Um, it's a, it's a, it always works in the boardroom. I mean, CAC payback is nothing else in the fancy way of saying a return of investment, really, right? Yeah. And, um, and you can do it really nicely with an SDR team. You can do it really nicely kind of as an overall. You can do it really nicely with, you know, uh, Google paid search. Mm -hmm. uh, but then, then it, you know, starts more and more dropping off, especially on the marketing side. It's very difficult to kind of do it in that way. Um, and you, you create a very, uh, you know, unhappy, un, uninspirational, uh, marketing team, they're always coming around the corner and like, cat pay, cat pay, pay, you know, what, what's the return on investment on that initiative, right? And, and, um, and you really, what you're kind of doing in the end there, you really, um, you're really robbing the marketing team of all the tools it has. And basically it's going to become a paid search. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be, Hey, let's do some social, but with book a demo, uh, CTAs, right? And, mm -hmm. And it just it just doesn't work like that. Um, and I think this is this is where I feel some VP sales CROs. It's kind of they they kind of they kind of go a little bit wrong there and try and less so to understand, you know, how does marketing actually work because it is different than calling someone up and trying to close a deal. It is different from that, right? And um, uh, and early on, I I was kind of very. Uh, very quick payback driven also on the marketing side, realizing that that's not how it should and can work and kind of moving away from that. Um, yeah, I, guess I don't, I don't, uh, so I probably have like a thousands of those, uh, those <laughs> mistakes, but um, I, I'm, I think what, what kind of sometimes on my mind is um, I actually more and more feel like all those commission plans for sales, it's maybe it's a mistake actually. I'm, um, you know, there, there's lots of research out there that kind of says it is, but very few companies have the guts to actually kind of try it out and do it. Um, I'm a little bit in a similar transition right now there. And it's like, it's very, it's, you know, those commission plans, I feel in 20 years, we look back and think like that maybe was a mistake, uh, but let's, let's see about that. Powerful words that 